Do you know why the military prosecution presented two coats as evidence against Lewis Powell? Powell wore only one coat the night he attacked Secretary Seward. On April the 14th, Lewis Powell ran from Mr. Seward's house without a hat, wearing only a bloody long gray coat. On April 17, Powell was arrested, still without a hat, but his long gray coat had no blood stains. Why not? Blood on the assassin's hat, but the long gray coat Powell wore during his arrest had no blood stains. To this day, the long gray coat has remained unexplained. So where did Powell get his replacement long gray coat? The prosecution claimed that the shorter brown coat found on April the 16th was the coat Powell wore during his attack on the Seward home, even though it did not match the description given by the witnesses. However, my uncovered evidence proved that the boots and the Colt pistol found on Lewis Powell during his arrest were given to him after Powell attacked Mr. Seward. Not only were there two suspicious coats involved in the investigation of Powell's attack on the Seward home, but there was also two recovered pistols. The unexplained extra coat and a hidden gun are undeniable proof of a War Department cover-up. All right, these are the two pistols recovered during the investigation of Powell's attack on the Seward home, but only one of these pistols was used as trial evidence. This is a box of Colt cartridges that were also found in Powell's coat pocket, and they go to this pistol right here, this Colt pistol. But this pistol was not presented. It was hidden. And there's a reason for that, and I'm going to explain to you why. The pistol used as trial evidence was for a broken 36 caliber Whitney Navy revolver popular among Confederate cavalry. However, the hidden gun recovered from the pocket of Powell's replacement long gray coat was a small Colt pistol popular with police detectives and Wells Fargo agents. The unbroken box of cartridges was for the Colt pistol. William Bell was the only witness to Powell's attack on Frederick Seward, Mr. Seward's son, and he testified that he never saw a pistol. Powell's weapon was round, mounted all over with silver and about 10 inches long. He said, I had taken it for a knife, but they all said afterwards it was a pistol. I'm pretty certain it was a knife. Powell obtained his coat pistol after he attacked Mr. Seward. Now this is the knife that Powell dropped in the front yard when he fled from Seward's home. and You can see that it's rounded at the end. It's mounted all over with silver, and it's about 10 inches long. This is what William Bell, the only witness to Powell's attack, said that he attacked Seward with. Now there's a reason that this pistol was planted in Mr. Seward's bedroom. Uh, this is a Whitney 36 caliber Navy revolver made in Connecticut by Eli Whitney's son, the inventor of the cotton gin. And uh, this was very popular with the Confederate cavalry. They liked this gun and they, uh, they even tried to duplicate it. Uh, this is a, a copy of the Whitney revolver made in Atlanta, but they didn't have the raw materials or the manufacturing to reproduce a, a gun like the Whitney revolver. Uh, this gun right here is not even made of steel. This, this barrel is made of iron, and the breech in the frame is brass. And you can notice right here that the the cylinder is mounted right up close to the breech and the reason for that is because if you fired this gun this iron barrel could very easily crack or explode so the brass breech was to protect the barrel from from splitting during when you shot it. Uh, this, this was a very poorly made gun but it's the best they could do with the conditions that they had. Uh, you can see that this was a, a much superior gun and it was highly sought after by the Confederates. And right here you can see where the barrel extends past the breech and into the cylinder. And uh, 
So that that was the reason they used this particular gun as a plant because um, it, it's identified with the, the Confederate cavalry, and that that was the whole purpose of this uh, uh, cover-up was to prove that the assassin of Secretary Seward was a Confederate agent. So the question is, uh, where did Lewis Powell get his long gray coat, new boots, and small Colt pistol? Well, they came from Lewis Weitzman, John Surratt's best friend. He gave Powell aid after Mr. Seward was attacked. So what happened after the first raid on Mary Surratt's house was that uh, on April the 15th, Lewis Weitzman and John Holohan, a boarder at Mary's house, reported to the Metropolitan Police and were made deputies to help United States Officer James McDevitt find and arrest David Harrell, George Atzerodt, and Lewis Powell, alias James Wood when he was in Washington, and he used the alias Lewis Payne when he was in Baltimore. Now this is uh, on the left, the actual National Archives document of Lewis Weitzman's statement, and he admits it right here that the second time he rode out on horseback was on Saturday morning, April the 15th, from Captain Tompkins' stable with some United States detective officers. We started in pursuit of the fugitives, but he left out something about that. Before Lewis Weitzman and some United States detective officers led by James McDevitt started in pursuit of Booth's kidnapping fugitives, they first rode government horses to the commissary or prisoner's office where Weitzman worked as a clerk. The War Department provided Weitzman a horse, a new Colt pistol, and a new pair of boots. Weitzman and McDevitt found Powell and gave him the boots, the pistol, boots, and passed for Saturday, April the 16th, and most likely the unexplained clean long gray coat. So this is a picture of Mary Surratt in her boarding house. Now, Weichman, McDevitt, Holohan have spent the entire day down in southern Maryland trying to find Booth's kidnapping conspirators, and they came back late at night to Mary's house to gather some clothes. They were going to spend the night at McDevitt's house. So they came in, and they had a key. They went oh, and locked the door. They went upstairs. They got some clothes, and they all left and spent the night at McDevitt's. Now, Mary Surratt was sound asleep, and she never knew that three men came into her house, but her servant girl, Susan Mahoney Jackson, was down in the basement, and she heard the three men come in, and she was scared. She didn't know who they were, and she surmised that they were conspirators talking to Mary Surratt and telling her that her son was in Ford's Theater with Booth on the night of the assassination. It was all just an imaginary concocted conjecture, but that's who the three men actually were. They were Houlihan, McDevitt, and Weichman, just gathering clothes. So the next morning, April the 16th, the War Department issued Special Order Number 68, sending James McDevitt and Louis Weichman to New York and Canada with private orders to capture John Surratt even though Weichmann had told the police that John Surratt had not been in Washington since April the 3rd. Now, this is that uh, National Archives document, and uh, this is order number 68, and it reads, The Special Officer James A. McDevitt and Louis Weichmann are hereby ordered to proceed to New York on important government business. So Weichmann has gone from a metropolitan detective to a government agent to hunt down John Surratt and bring him back to Washington. So they leave for Canada, and in the meantime, the next day on the 17th, Lewis Powell was arrested at Murray Surratt's boarding house. The three detectives searched Powell and found a loaded small Colt pistol and a box of unbroken cartridges in the coat pocket of Powell's long gray coat. And this is the National Archives document of that. This is uh, the statement by Charles H. Rose, one of the uh, three detectives who searched Powell. And in his document, he explains how they went to Murray Surratt's house. And down here at the bottom, it says... We found the following articles. One, small new revolver loaded. 
a package of cartridges unbroken, a pass for Saturday, and that's crossed out. You can see right down here at the bottom where he, he crossed that out. And this spelt big trouble now. Oh, no. Uh, the prosecution or the investigator says, you know, the prosecutors can't use this evidence. We've got to hide this. We can't, you can't submit this report because um, Powell is supposed to have had this Confederate gun left at the crime scene and... Uh, this is just too much trouble. So they had all, complete control over all the evidence and investigation and, and documents. So it was very easy for them to say, you know, we'll just keep all this hidden. Weissman's boss at the War Department, Captain D.H.L. Gleason, along with several other clerks, were witnesses to Weissman visiting the commissary office on Saturday morning, April the 15th, and on April 18th, Gleason gave a statement about Powell's boots and Colt pistol. Daniel Gleason's statement filled in the missing visit to the War Department. Lewis Weitzman's statement so deliberately left out. So this is uh, the National Archives statement of Daniel Gleason on the 18th. And it says right here, uh, the pair of boots which were found on the assassin of Secretary Seward were shown to the witness and he identified them as the pair Mr. Wright had loaned to Weitzman on Saturday morning. He loaned his boots and a pistol to Mr. Weitzman on Saturday morning before the other clerks. He had a horse and saddle there, and I supposed all was right in regard to it. Oh my gosh. Now this is really bad news for the investigators because now they have a War Department captain witness of the War Department giving... Lewis Weitzman, the same boots and gun that were found on Lewis Powell the night he was arrested and carried to Colonel Wells at General Augur's police station. That means that all the investigators knew about the boots and pistol, that they were duplicates. They had two pistols and they didn't need but one, so they had to get rid of the Colt pistol. When Stanton found out about Gleason's statement, he went berserk and he ordered Superintendent Richards to bring Weitzman back from Canada, have him arrested and brought to his office. Stanton had a two-hour interview with Weitzman, and Lewis Weitzman went from a War Department special agent to a War Department prisoner at the old Capitol prison and became the prime prosecution witness. This is the first page of that seven-page statement by Gleason, and it says right here, Gleason stated that Lewis Weitzman is his fellow clerk and has mentioned and heard him mention Booth, the French lady, which was Sarah Slater, John Surratt, George Atherat, David Hurl, and blockade runners like Spencer Howell. Uh, so this is proof positive that Weitzman was a snitch. He was a civilian informant paid by the War Department to to keep an eye on John Surratt. That's why he was living in Murray Surratt's house. That's why he gave up his prestigious teaching job to take a lowly clerk position at the War Department so he could report on on John and everything was going on. That means that the, the War Department, that Stanton, knew all about the kidnappers and their kidnapping attempt, and now Stanton's trying to frame them for the assassination. Right down here, it says, Mr. Wright loaned Weitzman a pair of boots and a pistol. Gleason identified the boots of Payne's Secretary Seward's assassin. He had a horse and saddle there. So that was McDevitt uh, providing um, Weitzman with the horse, and they went to the War Department, and the War Department gave him the boots and pistol, and that's what was on pile when he was arrested uh, two days later. The War Department investigators withheld Powell's Colt pistol, the police report by Officer Roche, and Captain Gleason's statement. April 19th, the other two officers who also searched Powell filed their police report, but said nothing about the Colt pistol, the Saturday pass, and made no mention of Officer Roche. So this is their National Archives police report. And this was by Thomas Sampson on the 19th, a day after Gleason had given his statement. 
and he admits to the box of pistol cartridges and he identifies them as being Colt holster pistol cartridges. And But he says nothing about fellow officer Charles Roche. And this is uh, Eli DeVoe's police statement, also on the 19th. And he admits to the box of pistol cartridges, but says nothing about the Colt pistol, nor pass for Saturday, and nothing about Charles Roche. So they can leave out the pistol. On the 24th of April, this is an inventory of uh, evidence turned over to Colonel Burnett. And they have Powell's pickaxe that he was carrying when he went to Mary's house, and they got the package of Colt cartridges found by Officer Sampson and DeVoe, but nothing about the Colt pistol and no pass for Saturday and nothing about Charles Roche. This is the cover-up. They've hid all this information. So, in May, the, the trial is underway and Eli DeVoe sends a telegram to the, uh, Judge Advocate General Joseph Holt and he's, this is it right here, and, and uh, and it says, the evidence of Thomas Sampson and Eli DeVoe will be valuable in the case of Mary Surratt and Louis Payne. But he says nothing about the evidence of Charles Roche, because that's the cover-up. So, there's a problem, though. Charles Roche doesn't have a police report to prove that he was eligible for a reward, that he was one of the three that arrested Powell. So... They chose him to be the only witness at the trial so he could have a paper document that proved that he was part of the arrest party. So right here it says, I was present uh, when the prisoner Payne was searched. And this is by Charles Roche. And this is all he said at the trial in a bundle of articles including a pair of boots uh, were shown to the witness, and he identified them, but he says nothing about his report. He says nothing about the pistol, about the pass for Saturday, and he does talk about the boots because they needed to cover that up. The boots came from the War Department, Mr. Wright, so they had to prove that the boots belonged to Booth, <laughs> and that's what that was all about. So that's uh, this is the document right here that really blew it all out of the water. This is uh, Gleason's statement, and uh, this was all hidden. So during the trial, Colonel Wells, Major General Christopher Auger, Colonel Lafayette Baker, Lewis Weichman, John Holohan, and James McDevitt each knew that Mary Surratt was not harboring fugitives. All knew that the information given by Susan Jackson was wrong and that Mary was arrested on false charges but they all kept that truth a secret. The police used Susan Jackson's statement as a convenient excuse to raid Mary's house a second time and capture Lewis Powell at the home of a well-known Confederate spy, John Surratt. All the military police who arrested Powell collected a large reward, including Colonel Wells and Alcott. Susan Jackson and her friend also were given a small share of the reward money. They all kept quiet and allowed Mary Surratt to swing from the gallows. Mary Surratt, Lewis Powell, David Hurl, and George Atzerott were executed for their association with Booth. But John Surratt's best friend, Lewis Weissman, was rewarded. After the execution, Weichman asked Stanton and Holt for compensation. Weichman asked Stanton for a government job and pointed out to Stanton that he gave Colonel Baker all he knew about Powell and Mary Surratt, and on his information, Powell was captured by the men under Colonel Wells and Orcott. Both Secretary Stanton and Judge Holt, as well as all their military investigators, knew that Weichman gave aid to Powell on the morning after the assassination, but Stanton and Holt twice rewarded Weichman with a position as a Philadelphia Customs House clerk. Lewis Weichman knew all about the kidnapping plot, and he worked with the War Department to have Powell arrested at Mary Surratt's house. That's what he's telling Stanton right here on August the 16th after the execution, and that's why Stanton and Holt looked after him. In fact, uh, Holt took care of 
Weitzman for years after Stanton died, and Weitzman spent the rest of his life trying to convince the world that he wasn't the lying coward that sent the innocent Mary Surratt to the gallows, but uh, that's the way it goes. And so if you, if you enjoyed this video and you'd like to learn more, visit my website at www.reasonlincoln.com and check out my article section and purchase uh, my two books. Uh, I got them in two formats, hard copy or ebooks. And uh, find out the reason Lincoln had to die and the reason Booth had to die. This particular video is taken from chapters 3 and 4 of my second book, The Reason Booth Had to Die. So thank you for watching and, and let me know what you think.